Mr. Ray was a disciplined man. In twenty years he had never been late for work, though he could well afford to be. After all, he had recently been performing not only his direct duties, i.e. treating his fellow countrymen, but at the same time he was also the head of a paramedic and midwife station. The workload increased after the so-called optimization when the higher authorities decided that the village doctors lived too well. Ray was outraged by such injustice at the time, and he stood up for his institution. In the regional health department, where he immediately went to defend the honor of the white coat, calmly listened to the paramedic and advised, do not make waves or you may lose your job. The bosses know what to do and how to do it, so keep your indignation to yourself. The deputy minister, a prim lady of Balzac age, was also talking to him. This woman drilled him with her small eyes in such a way that he felt hot in a moment. The man shrank a little, but he was not going to give up. Of course, you can see better from above. But then tell me, how alone to conduct the reception according to the schedule, and then still bypass those in need of help at home? After all, there are five other villages attached to our institution. There used to be a day hospital with six beds, but you took it away too. The official was tired of listening to the complaints of the disgruntled doctor, and she said irritably, Mr. Ray, why are you being so demagogic? Your direct duty is to follow the orders of the ministry. You're not the only one in this position. So go and do your job. As they say, less talk, more action. He stood up and walked towards the door, and at that moment something human awoke in the official. And she began to explain to the visitor the reasons for the current changes and population decline in a completely different tone. You are not the first day in medicine and you know very well that staffing depends on this indicator. And your birth rate is almost at zero, and the mortality rate is high. Hence all the problems. Ray paused for a few seconds. It's not my fault that young people are fleeing the village like hell. It's the opposite in the neighboring village, where life is booming. They're even going to build a new school this year. How are we worse than our neighbors? The woman shrugged her shoulders. How should I know? That's a question you should ask your superiors. Ray returned to his home village with nothing. He shared his worries with Mrs. Sophia, who had worked as a nurse all her conscious life. And now she also had to learn several related specialties. But the elderly woman managed to keep up with the receptionist, clean the building twice a day, and perform the duties of an administrator. After hearing the chief's report on the trip, she said with sadness in her voice, Yes, now we are with you, Ray, as in the proverb, and the reaper, and the reaper, and the player. But don't get too upset, God willing, things will change. But the Almighty didn't see their suffering. Or maybe he didn't see it yet. He's got plenty to do without Ray. At first it was very difficult to get used to the new rules, but again the omnipresent Aunt Sophia helped. Ray, you shouldn't be wasting your legs, and you're not old enough to be running around on foot. Get yourself a motorcycle or, at the very least, a bicycle. That way you'll be able to attend to the bedridden faster. You won't have to go door to door all night. Ray thanked his assistant for the advice. After all, you gave me the idea, and how did I not think of it myself? I have a bicycle, but it's very old. And you go to the neighboring village, ask Clara to order a bicycle for you. In the neighboring village there was a department store where you could buy almost any kind of goods. The clerk of the outlet went to meet the paramedic. Ray, I'm ready to deliver more than just a bicycle for you. Clara was a very amorous woman and had repeatedly given the paramedic various signs of attention. But the man had long ago closed his heart on a large padlock and only joked, Oh, Mrs. Clara, I am too old for such pleasures. At my age, the best kind of entertainment is riding a bicycle. Don't be so hard on yourself, Mr. Ray. You're still a man in your prime. Ray only joked again. Mrs. Clara, my juice has been fermenting for a long time. You can't even make moonshine of the right strength. Why don't you tell me when to pick up my bike? The saleswoman realized that the buyer does not fall for her tricks, and switched to an official tone. As brought, I'll call you immediately, so you can prepare money. Two days later the two-wheeled transport he ordered was brought to the department store, and the issue of movement in the neighborhood was safely resolved. Nine-year-old Mira was most excited about the bicycle. She immediately made a loud announcement. Daddy, after work I'm going for a ride, okay? Ray almost always complied with his daughter's whims but this time he disagreed with her. 
You're too young to handle the controls. You need a teen model. When we have the money, I'll buy you one. Murr dismissively replied to her father. Dad, I learned how to ride a grown-up bike a long time ago. Why are we wasting money? Better buy me a tablet, you promised. Ray sighed heavily, remembering his daughter's unfulfilled promise. But the salary of a village paramedic didn't allow him to spend a lot of money. He had to live in a constant state of austerity. The man looked at the alarm clock and muttered, Time to wake up, my winner. He tiptoed into the nursery and was surprised to find that Mira was not there. Daughter, where are you hiding? From the direction of the kitchen came a noise, to which the man immediately did not pay attention. To his question, the girl immediately answered, Daddy, I made breakfast. Come eat. Despite her young age, Mira was a good hostess. She kept the house clean and made some progress in the culinary field. In addition to the traditional scrambled eggs, the girl mastered more complex dishes. For example, she had a very tasty fried potatoes. Mira met her father with a question, Did you wash your hands? If you did, you can sit down at the table. The man had to obey his daughter, and he went to the cubbyhole, which he himself had converted into a sanitary room. Many times he praised himself for bringing water and sewerage into the house during the cold season. Now there was no need to run to the yard and no need to carry buckets of water from the well. However, he had to spend a lot of money to build these facilities. But now he and his daughter live in comfort. Wash your hands. The man thought that it would be necessary to install a bathtub. Then it would be a complete set of amenities. When Ray returned to the kitchen, his portion was already on the plate. Mira nodded to him, wishing him a pleasant appetite. From the look on her face and the tone of her voice, her father guessed that she was agonizing over some question. You don't look like yourself today. Spit it out. And what are your difficulties? The girl did not make herself long to beg. Daddy, I have two difficulties. The man sighed. Then let's take turns, but make it quick. I have sick people waiting for me. Mira tried to give her face a serious expression. It's always the sick and the sick. And you don't think about me at all. You're wrong because I think about you even when I'm treating patients. You're my most important person in the world. So what's your problem? Imitating her father, the girl sighed heavily. First, I'm scared to stay home alone. In summer, it's still okay. You can walk outside. But in winter, sometimes it's so scary. Tell me what kind of creepiness haunts you. Dad, I always feel like someone's watching me. Maybe it's grandma and grandpa coming here. Ray couldn't help smiling daughter. It's all in your head. You see all kinds of stuff in this thing, and then you scream at night. Ray nodded at the old laptop that was often the subject of their family arguments. Mira stepped her eyebrows together. Is that funny to you? Not at all. Tell me, what do I have to do to keep your fears at bay? It was as if Mira had been waiting for that question. Daddy, can I go to work with you? It's closer to your hospital and school and I can talk to Mrs. Sophia. By the way, maybe she can help me with my essay. Ray was already pulling on a warm jacket. You have an essay to write? The girl looked hopefully at her father. Yeah, Dad. Did you forget that Mother's Day is coming up? Our teacher told us to write about our moms. What am I going to write about if I don't have a mom at all? This unexpected question stumped the man. He even forgot that he was in a hurry to get to work. Mira waited for his answer and he thought of nothing better than to offer his daughter the simplest option. Believe me, you're not the only one. Not all kids have moms or dads. But it seems to me, there will be nothing wrong if you write what you would like your mom to be. The girl objected sharply. Daddy. But that's a lie. You said yourself that it's not good to lie. That's right. But this essay is a small literary work, so you can fantasize a little. Come on. Get ready to discuss this topic with Grandma Sophia. She'll tell you how to do the right thing. The girl squealed with joy and instantly put on warm clothes and winter boots. The paramedic station was at the other end of the village, so they had to walk a considerable distance. At this hour of the morning, there was no one out on the street, and only a few windows in the houses were lit, not the children's. Ray thought sadly that his home village was dying out, and soon there would be no one left. He also thought of his ex-wife Amanda on that November morning. A thought flashed through his mind. Yes, Amanda is a good mother. One could write an essay like that. 
If it was possible to turn back time, I would never let her go. In the pre-dawn gloom, the outline of the one-story building of the rural medical center appeared, and by the paths trampled in the snow, the paramedic guessed that his patients were already waiting for him. It's said that performers worry every day before they go on stage. Mr. Ray, despite his impressive work record, also always felt a little anxious before starting his workday. In order to avoid distractions, he handed his daughter over to Sophia. Aunt Sophia, if you wouldn't mind looking after my rascal. The elderly nurse gave him an indignant look. Why would you do that? Mira is a very good, well-mannered girl, and I'd love to talk to her. That's wonderful. Why don't you help her with her essay? Of course I will. I used to write such essays in my time, and I loved literature. I dreamed of studying to be a teacher, but my mom had to raise three of us alone so I had to make a living after ninth grade. Ray didn't have time to sympathize with the nurse. He walked briskly to the other half of the building, where there was a reception room, a treatment room, and a small physiotherapy department. On a couch outside the office, three regular customers waited patiently for him. As village custom called for a special greeting ritual, the paramedic raised his hand in warning. Good morning, everyone. You don't have to answer. After all, the most valuable thing in this world is time. Therefore, we will observe the cue and talk only on the merits. All right? Grandpa David jumped up from the couch and ran after the paramedic. Ray, I was here first. The medic grinned. Mr. David, you could have let the ladies have their way. You're a man. The old man's eyes flashed unhappily. The man was all out, and it was the women who brought him down. Because of them, the wretched ones. I have various ailments. I can barely move my legs. That's why I'm not going to be delicate with anyone. The grandfather looked at the women who were eating him with their eyes and whispered, I can't wait. My stomach is churning. I had it yesterday evening, so I can neither breathe in nor out. David held his stomach with both hands, and his weathered face was in extreme distress. Although Ray was well aware that the old man was exaggerating his agony, he paid due attention to his patient's complaints. Come in, David. We'll see what ails you. The paramedic laid the patient on the couch and gently pressed on his lower abdomen. Grandpa immediately realized that the medic was checking for a reaction to an inflamed appendix. Ray, I don't have an appendix. It atrophied long ago as an unnecessary element. I use a drug of my own preparation against all sorts of crap, so to speak, for prevention. Ray grinned as he continued to examine the old man's stomach. You must have overdosed on your own medicine this time, huh? That's why your stomach hurts, and frankly, your breath doesn't smell very good either. The older man shouted and sat down on the couch. I apologize for the smell, of course. You know, in any business there are side effects, but I am responsible for the quality of my product with my head. My moonshine is like a tear, a natural product. But I may have overdosed a little bit. I won't deny that fact. Yesterday, Victor and his friend came by, so we took a sample together. The paramedic gave the patient a judgmental look. It's time for you to quit your bad habits, Ray. It's bad for your health. And you might have a problem with the law, too. The old man exclaimed with emotion. I'm only doing this for me. I treated Victor and John yesterday. That's not forbidden. I gave them a token of my gratitude. I wonder what those two fellows did to you. David rolled his eyes and suddenly sang, I've been thrown into water and fire, but I always got out of hell. The old man diligently imitated the chansonnier, and in his gestures clearly guessed the manners of the blatant authority. This transformation was so unexpected that Ray even dropped the pen with which he was writing down the patient's complaints in the chart. Mr. David, please stop. If you want a song, please go to the club. There's no amateur talent show here. The old man was embarrassed. Sorry, Ray. They're really good songs, they're really catchy. John wrote the lyrics and Victor wrote the music. It turns out that he's a real composer, and he had to cross paths with the accordion player from the neighboring village. But his memories of this nugget are not positive. Perhaps your buddies do have talents, but at your age you need to temper your ardor a little. The old man sighed heavily. You're right, Ray. It's time to settle down. What's wrong with my stomach? The paramedic gave the patient a stern look. Your pancreas is probably complaining. It doesn't like strong drinks. The elderly patient began to wail. I'm done with this business. That's right. It's time to stop, David. In the meantime, go on a diet for a few days. 
nothing spicy, salty, or fried, and take these pills. Ray opened the glass cabinet where the emergency medicines were kept and took the pills out of the box. Grandfather David looked at the package for a long time and then said thoughtfully, I don't think I've ever taken one of these before. That's right, because you've never had such a bad seizure before. If the pills don't help or it gets worse, call me at my home number. Of course, with your symptoms would not hurt to go to a full examination, but in our conditions it is impossible. The old man is tense. And what happens if it gets worse? We'll have to go to the district hospital. There you will be examined and treated. Grandfather David instinctively grabbed his stomach. I wonder if I'll get a bellyache. It's not out of the question. The patient pulled his eyes out fearfully. That's it. The grasshopper has played the violin. What do we do now? Ray pushed the patient towards the exit. You have to get treatment and follow all the recommendations. Dangerous acquaintances should also be avoided. That's it. Not another drop. I swear on my mom. The paramedic smiled but did not remind David that his mother had long been buried in the local cemetery. He invited the next patient into the office, but both women were in no hurry to get medical attention. They gave David angry glances. One of them said prophetically, It's not without reason that they say you can't fix a humped man in his grave. All his life he ran around with women and drank vodka, and he still can't calm down. Ray did not enter into a debate with the patients, but hurried them. Lovely ladies, you can discuss all the hot topics later. Come on in. Who's next in line to criticize old David? The woman made her way to the office with a dignified stride. This patient was also familiar to Ray, and he asked her briefly, What are we complaining about today, Mrs. Julia? The older woman looked at him reproachfully. It's interesting, Ray. Sick people have to wait in the hallway for hours. And you get the drunks in first? The thought flashed through the paramedic's mind that this fury was called the shark in the village for a reason. But nothing. I will quickly put her in her place. The paramedic began to carefully explain to the patient the plain truths. Mrs. Julia, in our country all citizens, including those who abuse alcohol, have the right to qualified medical care. By the way, it's also a disease that needs to be treated. As for Mr. David, he should not be put in that category. I hope this matter has been settled. Julia fidgeted on the couch but said nothing. Ray changed his tone to a more friendly one. Now tell me what's bothering you. The woman readily listed all the complaints that prevented her from living in peace. Toward the end of her rather long monologue, she cried, Ray, I wish you'd give me pills that would cure everything. The doctor frustratedly spread his hands. Unfortunately, such a drug does not exist. The patient blew her nose into her handkerchief. I know, but I want to live a little longer. My granddaughter is due soon, and it's such a blessing to wait for great-grandchildren. Ray assured the patient. You're gonna be a great grandmother. We'll find a solution to your blood pressure. Although not yet invented such pills that help for all diseases, but we have old proven remedies. The paramedic opened his marvelous cabinet again and gave the patient the medicine. Be sure to call me if these pills don't make you feel better. But if you feel better, let me know too. I'll visit you tomorrow. And try not to be nervous. Avoid heavy exertion. Get plenty of rest. Thank you, doctor. The patient was touched by such attention to her person. Before leaving the office, she even made something like a bow. Only then did she hurry to leave the room. She nodded to the woman who was waiting patiently for her turn. Nina, you may come in. Ray was not well acquainted with this woman, although she lived two houses down from him. But her two husbands, who by some strange coincidence had died of heart attacks at about the same age, he knew well. Rumor had it that Nana had once again taken in a lonely bachelor from a neighboring village. And a few days ago, the same shark who had been at his reception only minutes ago had been terrifying the locals at the store. Nana is hiding her third, fearing he'll be jinxed here. I think this guy needs to get his legs done. People like Nana are called black widows, and this new guy's in danger of following his two predecessors. I wish someone had told him to do it. Then the women in the store raised the shark to laughter advising her to take on this noble mission. And all this was expressed in not quite decent terms, and Julia not on a joke offended. You have only one thing on your mind. Aren't you ashamed to say such vile things to me? One of the women said that everyone is equal under the blanket. Ray was a bystander to the verbal altercation that had made him laugh. Now he was looking at Nana, trying to see if there were any outward signs of illness. 
but the patient looked quite healthy. As if answering the paramedic's mute question, the woman said with a heavy sigh, There's nothing wrong with me. I came to ask you to see my Todd. He complained about his heart yesterday. He wanted to come to you, but I wouldn't let him. The paramedic remarked that he should have called an ambulance. The woman nervously fidgeted with her handkerchief. I didn't want to bother people unnecessarily. I thought I should consult with you first. So I came. The paramedic started packing her emergency bag. Well then, let's not delay. Let's go and see your patient. Accompanied by Nana, Ray headed for the exit, but Sophia stopped him. Ray, if you're on a call, bring two more addresses. One here at the scene. There's an old lady who fell, bruised her knee, and there's a young guy with a high fever not far away. The nurse handed the paramedic a sheet. I've written it down in detail. Thank you, Mrs. Sophia. I'll try to get it over with as soon as possible. And you send my student to school. It'll be done. She and I have written her essay and solve it all the examples in arithmetic. Ray thought it was good to be surrounded by kind people. He wanted to think about it some more. But Nana looked at him pleadingly, and he hurried after her to save another human life. Ray examined Nana's husband, but found nothing alarming about his condition. Then he checked on the traumatized old lady and went to the neighboring village to visit the sick guy. Although the village was less than two kilometers away, the snow that had fallen the previous day made it difficult to move. Ray remembered about the bicycle. It was easier in the summer. It would take me about five minutes to cover this distance, but now it would take an hour to get there and then back. He was really exhausted by the time he reached his destination. The boy's condition was also alarming because his fever had not been brought down. When the paramedic started on his way back, dusk was already beginning to fall. The man cursed in his thoughts. He had no time to do anything today. Mira must be home from school by now, and I'm not here. He remembered his daughter's fears and, despite his fatigue, quickened his pace. Suddenly he heard the screams. Help! Drown! The paramedic immediately realized that the cry for help came from the river. He ran to the call, falling knee-deep in snow. About ten meters from the shore, Ray saw a silhouette. The man muttered heartily. What an idiot had gone to the river because the ice had not yet risen. But there was no time to find out the identity of the man in need of help. The unfortunate man's head appeared above the surface for a brief moment, and then disappeared again. Ray had already had experience in rescuing drowning people, and at once concentrated on the important task at hand. He shouted to the injured man, Just don't make a fuss and do what I tell you. The paramedic left his briefcase and threw off his jacket, which was restricting his movements. It didn't take more than a minute to get ready, and it took another minute to crawl closer. The man could feel the ice crunching beneath him. He shouted, Grab onto this stick and hold on tight. Try not to make any unnecessary movements. But the one who was floundering in the icy water misunderstood the instruction and sharply pulled the extended stick. As a result of the victim's wrong actions, the rescuer also found himself in the water. To make matters much worse, the perpetrator of the accident panicked and started grabbing at the paramedic. Ray yelled at him, What are you doing? We're both going to drown. It's shallow. We got to get to shore. Try to find the bottom with your feet. He himself waded to the saving shore and dragged the man who kept repeating, It's a conspiracy, an enemy plot. At first the medic thought that the victim was delirious as a result of the shock he had suffered. But when they were safe, he realized that the man was heavily intoxicated. Ray jumped him. Why'd you get on the ice? The victim was shaking so hard his teeth were chattering. I was in a hurry to get to the store, ran out of fuel. Our store closes at four gars. Ray took a closer look and recognized the man as Victor, a friend of David's grandfather. Even though the paramedic wasn't in the best shape himself, he donated his jacket. Here, warm yourself up a bit. We should send you to the district hospital. Swimming in icy water won't do you any good. Ray was used to thinking of the patient first, then himself. He took the victim to the hospital and called a medical team from the district center. Only after that he went home. The next morning the man felt so bad that he could not tear his head from the pillow. Unlike the neighboring village, life here was literally boiling, and the village club was considered the center of activity. The path to the cultural institution was never overgrown. Even in winter there was a well-traveled path leading to it. 
In other words, the Village Club fully justified its second name, Hearth of Culture. All festive events were held here with a full house, and local talent delighted fellow countrymen with their talents. But many people remembered how dreary it was in their native village twenty years ago. The flowering of cultural life here began after the return to the small homeland of Miss Amanda. The countrymen always spoke warmly of this modest woman. She herself is small in stature, but she is capable of turning mountains upside down. Indeed, the director of the club did not have a bright appearance, but with the first word could take the audience. This unique ability Amanda demonstrated not only from the stage. Often she used her skills to achieve certain goals and objectives. One of the old-timers told how Amanda once took the regional department of culture by storm. It happened just after she and her daughter had moved here. Amanda was lucky in the sense that the director of the club ran away without even writing an application for settlement. So the village cultural center was inactive. There was a huge hole in the staffing table for two months. No one agreed to take the vacant director's position. But Amanda had a desperate situation, and when the district offered her to go to the director of the club, the young woman gladly agreed. Of course I would. She was happy that the employment issue had been resolved so successfully because her parents' house was small and three families could fit into it with great difficulty. Her younger brother, with his wife and small child, also lived under the wing of the ancestors on the grounds of housing inconvenience. Already in the first weeks after Amanda's return and the family began to flare up serious scandals. The main provocateur of scandals was the brother, Leonid. He reproached his sister for her frivolity. Why did you leave Ray? A normal man? A paramedic? Everyone respects him. He had a little fling. That's no big deal. You should have forgiven and forgotten. But you decided to show your pride. And as a result, my parents and my family are suffering. Of course, the suffering of his older sister Leonid did not care at all, and he daily expressed her discontent. Soon the process was joined and brother's wife Irma. The girl expressed her resentment not only to Amanda herself, but also to her daughter. Katerina was only three years old, and she did not understand why Aunt Irma scolded her. It got to the point that the little girl started to cry when her aunt appeared. Her parents pretended nothing was going on. And when Amanda asked her father to intervene, he answered her rather rudely. Leonid is right. You shouldn't have jumped out of your seat. I don't know what you've been missing. Her husband has a huge house and a good job. Amanda did not listen to her father and left her parents' house together with her daughter. She found a temporary shelter with a school friend, but she realized that she could not stay with her forever. So she gladly agreed to become the director of the club. But after taking inventory, Amanda's joy instantly faded. Not only was the Hearth of Culture building a sad sight, but inside it was in total disrepair. The heating system didn't work, the windows and doors didn't close, and the floors were falling through. This depressing picture was completed by the absence of everything necessary for normal work. Costumes, musical instruments, props. There were not even curtains on the windows, and all the furniture had been laid out. Seeing what she had inherited, Amanda did not fall into despondency, but cheerfully said, It's all right, I'll fix it. The villagers laughed as they watched the young enthusiast trying to put the club in order. Oh, Amanda, give it up. You'll never make it. She answered cheerfully. Nothing. The eyes fear the hands. Having cleared the building of the piles of garbage and empty bottles left by her predecessor, Amanda went straight to the deputy of the village council. Soon the club had heating and some furniture. But the new director decided not to rest on her laurels and headed for the district center. She went around several city organizations, asking the leaders to help the village club as much as possible. Of course, no one refused her. Private entrepreneurs also responded. They decided to chip in for musical instruments. Their gift brought tears not only to the director of the village club, but also to the local residents. If we have been blessed with such a good fortune, then we must justify the cost. People have spent so much money on us for a reason. Let the children learn to play. When the club got warmer and cozy like a house, Amanda and her daughter moved there. Of course, she did it with the permission of the local authorities. The deputy was sympathetic to her living situation. Mrs. Amanda, it's a pity that we can't allocate you a normal house yet. But I promise you that I will keep this issue under my personal control. However, soon the elected official forgot about his promise. 
Amanda and her daughter lived in the club for almost ten years, but she did not complain about fate and went completely into her favorite work. Already in the first years, only thanks to her efforts, a folk instrument ensemble was created, which quickly became famous throughout the region. Village children and adults also spent their leisure time in the club with pleasure, even in spring and summer, when field work was in full swing. Local talents took an active part in all the events. Amanda was praised by her fellow countrymen. How lucky we were to have a club director. It is hard to imagine that not so long ago our village was boring and only tipsy men sang songs. The kind comments of the villagers reached the house of Amanda's parents, but they pretended not to hear anything. Only Leonid almost every evening during the family dinner washed his sister's bones. Yesterday I accidentally dropped by the club. Amanda turned her back on me, like she didn't even know. Alla timidly asked her son, Why did you go there? Just for fun? Unexpectedly the father expressed his point of view. No, Leonid, you did not just crawl there. You're jealous that your sister is doing well, and you still have not achieved anything in life. Irma stood up for her husband. What are you talking about? Leonid is a good family man and a good father. Father didn't even listen to his daughter-in-law. If he is so exemplary, why can't he move away from his father, from my mother and me? Mother was afraid that there would be a scandal. So she started to persuade her husband. Please don't. Leonid has temporary difficulties. Soon everything will be settled. Why are you always sticking up for him? The man is already more than thirty, and he still hides behind mom's skirt. But after he got married, he got a second skirt. That was a clear indication of Irma's willingness to protect her husband. The father of the family was not on a joke, so the rest of the household remained silent. The man ended his accusatory speech with a confession. Unfortunately, I can't be proud of my son. But I'm very happy for Amanda, and I'm pleased that people speak well of her. It's a pity that I fell under your bad influence and, in fact, threw my daughter out of her home. This act does not give me peace. Leonid threw his father with a grin. So go. Fall at the feet of our queen. The father clenched his fists. It's none of your business. When the time comes, I'll go and apologize to Amanda. She's a strong woman. You should look up to her, not judge her. The regional department of culture also advised to take an example from Amanda. After all, Amanda proved herself not only as an excellent organizer, she was also very resourceful when it came to the prosperity of the cultural institution assigned to her. Many difficulties the director of the village club could eliminate by her own efforts, but sometimes she had to resort to unconventional ways. Everyone was in a quandary when suddenly the folk instrument ensemble was invited to participate in a state fair. Amanda was at a loss. What are we going with? We don't even have proper costumes, let alone instruments. Her deputy and artistic director came up with an idea, something we could buy. In the soul of the head of the amateur group woke up a professional. What are you talking about? A good instrument costs money. Do you know how much it costs to go somewhere with a cheap instrument? That's the lot of the poor. We'll be laughed at. Personally, I'm against such a disgrace. For example, Victor's accordion is in such bad shape that it's about to fall apart during the performance. Amanda looked contemptuously at the leader. Don't make a big deal out of it. You can easily buy a used accordion. There are plenty of such offers on the internet. Play such an instrument yourself. The deputy took Amanda's side. She's right. We shouldn't even be messing around with our equipment. I don't want to hear the sneering, what can we expect from the village, again. The chief concluded with an obvious challenge. I don't understand why all this reasoning and discussion. We should give up the trip and that's it. It's the easiest thing to refuse. We should try to solve this issue. He laughed nervously. Mrs. Amanda, how will you solve it? Will you take out a loan to buy an accordion for Victor? I'll take out a loan if I have to. That way, Victor will drink the instrument away. There was some truth in these words because Victor occasionally drank heavily. But the deputy decided to calm down the director of the club. I'll take care of Victor during the tour. He will not step aside. I won't let something like last time happen. He was alluding to an incident that happened before Amanda took over as director. The village vocal ensemble had been invited to a neighboring district for a large-scale event. Victor also went with them, because he was a communicator of the group and received a salary for it. The beginning of the tour did not portend trouble. The artists sat down in the bus ordered for them, 
and went to the neighboring district. Victor periodically touched a bottle of mineral water and to the silent questions of his companions cheerfully answered, It's very hot. I was thirsty. The man wavered his handkerchief vigorously to convince them. The unsuspecting women believed him. They could not even think that Victor would think of mixing vodka with mineral water. The accordionist's evil plan was revealed only when one of the soloists asked him for a sip of water because his mouth was all dry. Victor blushed and began stammering to explain that the water was already exhausted. The woman snatched the bottle from him, but didn't have time to take a sip, because a pungent odor hit her nose. She attacked the accordionist, not choosing expressions. You bastard. You decided to disrupt our performance. It won't work. We'll give you a mini sobering up center. The women confiscated a bottle from the accordionist, and when they arrived at the place they followed him. By that time, Victor was already quite intoxicated, and he could hardly put on his folk costume. There were about fifteen minutes left before the group went on stage when Victor had to go to the bathroom. Since there were no other men, the women had to believe his oath. Girls, I'll be right back. Just wait for me. The concert began, but Victor did not return. The women asked a strange man to hurry up their missing actor's company, but Victor was not in the public restroom. They had to ask the presenters to postpone their performance. Time passed, and Victor did not appear. The ensemble would have had to leave with nothing if they had not been helped by an accordionist from another group who also took part in the concert. The man was a virtuoso on the instrument and quickly picked up the tonality to the three pieces that were announced in the program. The women performed well, but the fallout from the prank spoiled all impressions. One of the participants with undisguised anger said that Victor will definitely not get home today, because I will swat him in the bus with my own hands. Another woman sadly said, It's not worth getting your hands dirty over such a low life. If only he hadn't drunk the accordion. But Victor, though he liked to drink, valued his instrument very much. When his blood rose in his veins, and he managed to escape unnoticed from the toilet, which he visited with an accordion in his hands, he went to amuse the people. Of course, his talent was rewarded with more than one shot of alcoholic beverage, and some people thanked the musician with a glass of beer. In a word, by the evening Victor was completely disoriented in the space. With songs he went to look for his home in a foreign city, but since Victor was registered in a completely different place, he did not find his home and fell asleep in the park on a bench with a bayon in his hands. Victor was awakened by a kind-hearted policeman. The policeman shook up the guest. Wake up, man. The fair is over and everyone has left. Vicor rushed to look for his bus, but it had left in the evening. He searched his pockets for money, forgetting that he was wearing a concert suit. Victor was very thirsty, and he rushed to the fountain in the center of the park. Only three days later, in the early morning Victor reached his native village. His fellow countrymen greeted him like an astronaut who had been on the ISS for several months. After a long journey his suit and boots were in complete disrepair but his accordion was intact. Everyone in the village knew the story of this journey by heart. Amanda also knew about this adventure, so she was afraid to take Vicor on tour, but the warden persuaded her. All that remained was to get a new accordion and some other instruments. Amanda immediately decided not to give up on small things and went to the state government. She got the highest official of the Department of Culture to receive her, and from the doorstep she said, We may live in a village, but that doesn't mean we are entitled to the worst. Shocked by this introduction, the official asked, Who are you? Amanda raised her head proudly and extended her hand to the man. Mrs. Amanda, the director of the Palace of Culture. Apparently the sounding name of the village made a strong impression on the official. But just in case, he asked, Excuse me, where is it? Amanda was not used to lying and answered honestly, It's a village. You see, we have to go on tour and we have no instruments. So I came here to ask for your help. The official's brain refused to understand that now even in villages there are palaces of culture, whose groups make touring trips. But he realized that the woman who came to see him would not give up her goal. The official called an emergency meeting and even invited Amanda to attend it. Amanda did not tell anyone how she managed to get money for instruments and costumes, but the amateur artist went on tour in full equipment. Amanda liked to get to work early. From her subordinates, she also demanded strict observance of labor discipline. Of course, not everyone liked it, 
but most of all resented the established order of the deputy. Our Amanda doesn't know how to get a rise out of her superiors. Probably just wants to get to the top. Maybe she'll earn a heroine star on her chest. The boss couldn't stand gossip and usually didn't support such conversations. Listen, who prevents you, as you put it, to serve your superiors? She replied with her usual disdain. I do not sell out for handouts, and our Amanda is ready to break into a board for the slightest favor. Although she did manage to get an apartment in a new building. I'd do my best for a gift like that. The boss cut the woman off. I don't understand why you're making dirty little innuendos. You're just jealous of Mrs. Amanda. That's why you're making up stuff about her. I've long suspected that you're anxious to get into the principal's chair. The man spoke calmly, but with each word the woman's face became more and more flushed. Finally she couldn't take it anymore and shouted, Put your guesses in one place. I won't tell you what place it is because you know where it is located. The altercation between colleagues took place in a small vestibule in front of the auditorium, where it was always dark, so the disputants did not notice the appearance of the director of the club. But she heard the last phrase thrown by the deputy, but decided not to emphasize it. My friends, don't argue in vain. It's better to direct your energy in a positive direction. The rehearsal is in half an hour, and I want it to go off without a hitch. The substitute grumbled unhappily. Oh, Mrs. Amanda, is a local concert really worth the hassle? Believe me, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Amanda smiled. I'm not. This place is staffed by real professionals. The woman smiled. Thank you for your confidence, Mrs. Amanda. Are we going to rehearse with the lights? I told you yesterday with lights, costumes, in and out. So today is the dress rehearsal for tomorrow's concert. The deputy couldn't help herself? Oh my God. Such pathos as if this is not a village club but the stage of the Bolshoi Theater. Listen to me. There are also people in the village who have heart and soul, and this means that you have to work with full dedication and not to churn out hackwork, as it used to be widely practiced. it. The deputy threw a hateful glance at the woman in charge, but said nothing. The woman had worked under the former director, and when he ran away, she also went into hiding for a while. She was very afraid that their machinations with paid services would be revealed and when the clouds cleared over her head, she returned in the hope that she would be offered a managerial position. But she was too late, and her hopes were dashed. She immediately realized this when she returned to her home cultural institution, where Amanda was already in full swing. Since even in a large village is not much to go around, she had to be on the sidelines again, but she knew that one day will come her finest hour, and in order not to leave before it came, she performed her duties faithfully. Everything was ready for the dress rehearsal, and the participants were eagerly awaiting the beginning, but the deputy was running around the offices in confusion. Where is Victor? Had anyone seen Victor? A cursory inquiry revealed that no one had seen the accordionist since yesterday. Nika took out her cell phone and started dialing the communicator's number. There was no answer. She pounced on the supervisor. Mr. Gobi, where is Victor? The head of the ensemble raised his eyebrows in surprise. It is not known where Victor is. It's not in my competence, Mrs. Nika. It's your direct responsibility to control the employees going out to work. Nika wanted to put him in his place, but at that moment, Amanda came out of her office. The director of the village club was in a good mood, as evidenced by her cheerful voice. Greetings, everyone. Let's start the rehearsal. The gathered talents shouted their agreement and headed for the small auditorium. Only Nika hesitated at the entrance. Mrs. Amanda, you see... Here's the thing. The smile instantly disappeared from Amanda's face. You're being direct. What's going on with you guys again? Victor didn't show up. Where is he? I have no idea. Maybe he's sick. How hard could it have been to find out before rehearsal? Why do you always put me on the spot at the last minute? Amanda tried to restrain herself, even though it was very difficult. You know that teamwork requires everyone's full commitment. Nika was annoyed by everything the director's cautionary tone, Victor's disappearance, and the amateur performers yelling backstage. She defiantly declared, Well, yes, I'm the weak link here. I'm the one causing all the trouble. Amanda sharply interrupted her subordinate. Mrs. Nika, stop being hysterical. We'll rehearse without Victor. But you try to find out what's wrong with him. Maybe the man is really sick, Melnikova asked confusedly. 
What about the concert? Who will accompany Victor instead of him? You seem to have the impression that this is your first day as artistic director. I advise you to always work out a few alternatives. This is a very useful practice in case you suddenly have to change the program for some reason. Of course, it will be a pity if Victor doesn't show up tomorrow, but we won't cancel the numbers with his participation. We'll put on a Minus phonogram. Nika stared. But we haven't rehearsed with Minus. There's still time till tomorrow. That's what you'll do right now. Nika didn't say anything, but it was obvious from her expression that she wasn't happy with the principal's order. Turning on her heels, the woman headed for the stage. Not a minute later, her instructions began to come from the audience. Friends, our accordionist is not here yet, so we will rehearse with a phonogram. The singing group was dissatisfied with this decision, so we had to intervene. Don't make any noise. In the life of an artist, there are often unpredictable circumstances when it is necessary to make urgent corrections. This is exactly the case with us. Our orchestra will also have to change something in the program because of Victor's absence. Again, there were murmurs of discontent. But soon the phonogram sounded and the vocalists sang. Amanda's cheerful voice cut into the sound of the popular song. My dears, cheer up. You are not at a wake singing about your native village. Satisfied with the rehearsal, Amanda went to her office. At that moment, her cell phone rang. It was an unfamiliar number. Amanda excitedly answered it. Amanda speaking. An unfamiliar female voice shouted out. Mrs. Amanda? Yes, it's me. This is Mrs. Sophia, the registrar at the outpatient clinic. I'm listening, Mrs. Sophia. There was noisy breathing and Amanda realized that she didn't know how to get to the point. She decided to help the strange woman. Is something wrong? You're not just calling me, are you? Yes. Yesterday we had an emergency. A fellow was in a hurry to get to the store, took a shortcut, went across the river and fell through the ice. And Mr. Ray rushed to his rescue and went under. He asked me to call you when they took him to the county hospital this morning. He's in a bad way, Mrs. Amanda, and he's got no place to put his little girl. What girl? Ray's daughter, Mir. I've got her for now. But Ray's asked you to take her in for a while. But the kid must have a mother. I mean, she's there, but she's not there. Nika came into the office. Her eyes held a look of extreme surprise. Mrs. Amanda, it's about Victor. Amanda waved for her to wait. She promised Sophia she'd be there soon and she'd tell her everything. Okay. The nurse assured her she'd wait. Nika was getting impatient, and when the club director disconnected her cell phone, she said in a voice full of horror, Victor had drowned himself. Amanda even sat down on the table. Where'd you get that information? A grandmother told me. She has a daughter who lives here. She sings in our choir. Amanda was shocked. How could she be? Victor was here yesterday. I talked to him. How did this happen? Nika was in a state of confusion too, so she was rambling. Mrs. Amanda, don't be so upset. It'll all work out. A man is dead. And you're telling me not to be upset? I misspoke a little bit. Victor didn't exactly drown. He was rescued. A paramedic walked by and pulled the poor guy out. Ray was the one who rescued Victor. Nika didn't understand. She stared at Amanda with unblinking eyes and moved her lips soundlessly. The club director was the first to deal with the shock. She began to hurriedly dress. Nika, you're in charge. Finish with the rehearsal and be sure to check all the costumes, and let all the concert participants come half an hour early tomorrow. She nodded her head in agreement, mumbling, Don't worry, Mrs. Amanda, everything will be done. Amanda sprinted out of the club, buttoning up as she went. She settled behind the wheel of her cozy hatchback, having time to think. It's a good thing I drove the car out of the garage today as I felt the need to go. The reason wasn't exactly pleasant, though. She had owned her own car less than two years ago, but she had already thanked fate a hundred times for it. Amanda had long dreamed of a car, because her position was connected with constant traveling, but for a single mother raising her daughter, a personal vehicle was considered an unacceptable luxury. Suddenly she learned that the village club under her leadership took the first place for the year. For high achievements in the cultural field, Amanda received not only a diploma in a gilded frame, but also a substantial cash reward. However, the available amount was not enough to buy a car, but her father helped. 
He had long been looking for an opportunity to establish relations with his eldest daughter. And this opportunity came up. He brought the money and asked her guiltily, Daughter, let's forget all the old stuff. We're family. Amanda threw herself at her father's neck. Of course, Dad. I don't resent you at all, I promise. Now she remembered her father with warmth and thought that life likes to give unexpected surprises, and today it had given her one. Of course, he, Amanda knew about the existence of her ex-husband's child, but she had never seen this little girl. It wasn't the baby's fault, she thought. Too bad for the girl. Too bad for Ray, too. And he deserved mercy. He saved a man after all. We should help him. It didn't take more than ten minutes to get to the next village. Sophia met Amanda as if they'd known each other for years. The elderly nurse explained the details of what had happened and held out a crumpled piece of paper. That's the phone number I wrote down, just in case you want to call and see how Ray is doing. I'd better go talk to the doctors. You guys come in here too. We gotta figure out what to do with the girl. I'll be sure to stop by on my way back. Her excitement subsided, and her thoughts became more focused. Amanda was surprised to realize that her past resentments against her husband no longer had the same power. She wanted to help the man who had once helped her out in a big way. Amanda had been intimidated by the whiteness of the hospital before and had only turned to the medical profession as a last resort. Ray had always scolded her for that. You can't treat your own health with such disregard. After all, it's easier to prevent a disease than to treat it for a long time. True, and change the mind of his wife Ray could not, and she carefully avoided visiting doctors, and when he reproached her for frivolity, joked back, Why should I go to hospitals when I have my own doctor at home? His wife's frank flattery disarmed the paramedic, and he left her alone for the time being. Ray himself strictly adhered to a healthy lifestyle, so he was rarely sick. At least during their life together, which was a little less than five years, Ray was only once on sick leave with the flu. So Amanda had never seen her husband in such a helpless state as she had on that November day. When she arrived at the area hospital, the woman at the information desk said in an indifferent voice that he had been sent first to therapy and then transferred to the intensive care unit. He got worse. You should see the doctor, he's still here. He will tell you everything. The doctor who received the patient briefly described the situation. The situation is serious. Bilateral pneumonia. And the form is aggressive, you might say. That's why we've decided to move your husband to the ICU. We'll observe him for a couple of days and, if his condition improves, we'll transfer him back to therapy. The woman impatiently interrupted the doctor. Can I see him now? Actually, it's not advisable. Please, I really need to. I've come all this way. Believe me, if Ray sees me, he'll feel better immediately. The doctor smiled. Well, if that's the case, you're welcome to come in for five minutes. Just put on a robe and booties. Amanda complied with the doctor's instructions and followed him into the ward, where the machines were humming quietly and the staff was all dressed in white. The woman remembered her childhood fears when she had experienced an unpleasant moment during a visit to the dentist. The doctor stopped at the wide open door. Come in, your husband is here. There were six beds in a large room. Amanda stood at a loss, not knowing where to go. The doctor pointed to the nearest bed. Didn't you recognize your husband? There he is. The woman was embarrassed. She couldn't explain to the doctor that she and Ray had been separated for a long time, even though the divorce had not been formalized. Amanda cautiously approached the bed the doctor had pointed to and could hardly recognize her ex-husband in the pale, graying man. Half of Ray's face was covered by the oxygen mask, but it was noticeable how heavily he was breathing. He saw her immediately, and his eyes sparkled. Amanda crouched on the edge of the white stool and gently touched the man's hand. Sophia told me everything. Don't worry, I'll be sure to take care of your girl. I can imagine how surprised Katerina will be to see her little sister. The corners of her lips lifted beneath the mask, and Amanda realized the man was smiling. He tried to say something to her, but she stopped him warningly. You don't have to say anything. When you're fixed, you'll say anything. The main thing is not to think about anything bad and get better quickly. If I can, I'll come by tomorrow after the concert. Thank you. The patient raised his eyebrows in surprise and the woman explained with a smile. You saved our accordionist. Though he drinks a lot, he's a real talent. They say God kissed. A familiar doctor appeared in the doorway. 
Amanda realized she had to leave. She squeezed the man's hand and said softly, Get well, Ray. See you later. All the way back, Amanda thought about her failed family life. She had been dating Ray's brother for a long time. They were already thinking of getting married, and the young man decided to get a job in the Merchant Navy to earn some money. The last day before the long voyage he was to take, they spent together. Rick drew her pictures of their happy future. You and I are going to have three kids and you're going to do all the housekeeping, and I'll be the one earning the money for our happy life. Amanda believed it would be exactly as Rick planned, but he left and disappeared. He didn't write or call not only her, but also his parents and brother. The girl was in total despair and decided that the beloved found another. She very much experienced the betrayal of the man with whom she was going to live her whole life. In that difficult period, she was very much helped by Ray. He not only supported her morally, but also decided to save the honor of the deceived girl when he learned that she was pregnant by his brother. Amanda still remembers the words he said then. I will never hurt you, and I will love your child as my own. The girl knew that Ray's younger brother was in love with her and was making such sacrifices for this bright feeling, though she had no such feelings for him, accepted the sacrifice. At their wedding, the two villages partied. Amanda believed that only happiness awaited her in the future. After all, Ray was a kind, responsive man. He tried to prevent her every wish, and his profession was honorable, for which he was respected by everyone in the neighborhood, but the idyllic period did not last long. Almost immediately after Katerina's birth, Ray became completely different. His complacency disappeared, and he began to reproach her more and more often with having covered up her shame. Of course, Amanda did not keep silent, and also said to her husband in the face unpleasant things. Scandals became more frequent in the family, and later Ray stopped sleeping at home. To all questions he answered briefly. He was at work. I feel safer there. But one day Amanda went to the store to buy milk and ran into the village gossip, Julia. At that time, the woman was still sturdy and looked young. But the nickname Shark was already firmly attached to her. Julia expected an apology from the young mother, but Amanda was so engrossed in her own unhappy thoughts that she walked to the counter after the confrontation. Outraged by this neglect of her person, the Shark commented on Amanda's manners. Look at her, all proud of herself. She almost knocked me down and didn't even apologize. I can see why our paramedic's been on a bender. How can you live with such a woman? Ludmila is prettier and more respectful. Amanda walked home, unable to feel the ground beneath her. She barely waited for Ray to get home and lashed out at him. Why am I the last to know that you cheated on me? She expected her husband to be confused, to make excuses. But Ray calmly replied, Amanda, it's not for you to make such claims against me. Or have you forgotten what kind of dowry I married you with? It was a blow to the heart. The young woman cried all night, and in the morning she felt sick. Ray was frightened and took his wife to the district hospital. There she was examined for a long time by doctors of different specializations, and then they came to a unanimous opinion. Dear colleague, your wife has nervous exhaustion. We'll have to keep her hospitalized for a week. Then Ray was scared out of his mind and tearfully apologized to her. Amanda, I'm sorry, it's just tiredness at work and all that. Although the woman didn't understand how fatigue could affect their relationship, she forgave her husband. She stayed in the hospital for five days and started asking the doctor to discharge her early. After much persuasion, the doctor agreed. All right, Mrs. Amanda, I'll let you go. But you promise me that you will not be nervous about nothing. The woman hastily assured the doctor, I promise. Amanda flew home as if on wings. She missed her daughter, who had stayed with her father, and she couldn't wait to start a new life. After all, Ray had promised that everything would be different for them. Opening the door of the house, the woman realized that she was not expected here. Her husband wasn't home, but a strange girl was in the kitchen. When she saw Amanda, she turned pale. Are you back already? The girl's reaction to her appearance surprised Amanda, and she asked her a counter question. Why are you surprised that I'm back? And who are you, and what are you doing here? The situation was clarified by Katerina. Mommy, please don't scold Aunt Ludmila. She is kind. She plays with me and sleeps with Daddy, so that he is not afraid. The girl jumping up ran to the corner with the toys. 
and I'm not afraid to sleep alone, because I'm already big. When Ray came home from work, Amanda had already packed her and her daughter's things. She didn't notice the moment Ludmila disappeared. But she didn't care anymore. Her husband understood without a word. He didn't try to persuade her. He just said quietly, Amanda, maybe you shouldn't be so hot-headed. Think about it. You're not without sin. Yes, Ray, I'm not sinless, but I don't want to be reminded of that every day. I've already thought about it and realized that it's not going to work out between you and me, and you're going to find a pure and innocent girl, she said regretfully at the door. Ray, I had a better opinion of you. You should have been shy with that kid when you were dragging that girl into bed. Amanda remembered for the rest of her life how she and her young daughter had gotten to her parents' house that night in the pouring rain. She also remembers how she was greeted unfriendly at her parents' house. All these scraps of memories of the past swirled in the woman's mind as she made her way home. Only once she was in her home village did she remember that she had promised Sophia that she would stop by on her way back. She dialed the number of the dispensary and immediately heard a familiar voice. This is the dispensary on duty. Mrs. Sophia, it's me. I'm sorry. But it slipped my mind and I slipped past. The nurse calmed her down. It's okay. I thought I'd better leave Murr alone. She's worried enough about Daddy being sick today. Amanda, tell me, how's our Ray? Uh, not good. He's breathing through a mask in the ICU. The doctor said he has severe pneumonia. The old woman said she was confident. He'll pull through. He's still young. He's got a strong constitution. The next day Amanda called the hospital and was told that Ray had already been moved to a general ward. She barely waited until the concert was over and rushed to the district center. Ray was still very weak, but he greeted her with a happy smile. Amanda, thank you. I'm sorry to bother you, but I have no one else to turn to. You happen to be the only person close to me. Ray, you can't worry and try not to talk so much. The man was touched by her concern. It's still nice to have someone worry about you, she said sadly. You know, I realized yesterday too, when I heard about the accident, that you are not a stranger to me. Yes, it's a pity that you and I didn't realize it earlier. But that's okay. You learn from your mistakes. Maybe we can still make things right. He looked at her hopefully, and she answered, We can. Don't worry about your daughter. She was with Mrs. Sophia yesterday, and today I'll take her to my place. I have a big house. The two of us will have more fun together. Where's Katerina? She's in medical school. She's graduating this year. The man said thoughtfully. A colleague, then. Amanda. Here's what I want to ask you. If something happens to me, don't put my daughter in an orphanage. She's a good girl. You'll get along with her. Ray, don't you dare think of anything bad. You're gonna be fine. Pneumonia's not that bad. He tried to smile, but suddenly he started coughing. Amanda watched him squirm in pain with each spasm. Ray, drink some water. It'll get better. It's okay. It'll go away. I haven't told you everything yet. Ray, maybe we shouldn't talk about sad things right now. You're the one who taught me to have hope and faith. Yeah, I did. I want to believe in the best, but I'm a medical professional, and I know my own condition. By all accounts, it's not just pneumonia. All right, well, I won't get too excited. I'll just hope it's nothing. But just in case, I want you to know that I've signed the house over to you. I made a will a long time ago, back when Mira's mother left. Amanda could see that the man was completely powerless. She sat beside him for a while longer, and when he fell asleep, quietly left the room. Katerina always arrived home on Friday night. Amanda waited anxiously for her daughter's appearance. She didn't know how she would take the arrival of another tenant in their home, but with Mira she immediately found a common language. The girl willingly told her about her school friends and even showed her essay, for which for some reason she was given a bad mark. I don't know what Mrs. Angela didn't like. I got it right. Would you like to read it? The girl looked hopefully into her eyes and hesitantly held out the notebook. Amanda smiled. I'd love to read your creative work. I used to love to compose too. I even wrote little stories. Amanda read the girl's revelations and could hardly hold back her tears. Mira admitted in her essay that she had no mother yet, but a very good father. And he is good because he treats people. Also, among the worthy qualities of her father, 
The girl mentioned his ability to braid her pigtails and cook delicious porridge with raisins. The woman felt that Mira was watching her expression. When she returned the notebook to the girl, she asked, Did you like it? The woman couldn't help herself and hugged the child. I liked it very much. You wrote everything right. You really have a wonderful daddy, the girl remarked philosophically. Of course it would be much better if there was a mom, but I don't remember her at all, because I was very little when she left. I've asked daddy many times where she went, but he won't tell me the truth. Murr thought for a while, and then she said thoughtfully, At first I thought she was sick, and that's why she couldn't come, but people get well after they're sick, that's what daddy says. Amanda really wanted to know everything about the mother of this cute little girl, but she didn't want to traumatize the child with unnecessary questions. She decided to find out the details of the girl's fate from Sophia. The nurse didn't have to beg twice and told her everything she knew. Oh, Amanda, there's such a murky history with Mira's mom. Her name is Sarah, last name's Macmillan. I don't know where she's from, but she showed up here after she got out of juvie. I don't know exactly what they put her in there for, but people said she was a burglar. She'd pick up a lonely old lady in the park, talk some sense into her, then grab her bag and run. Why did she come to your village after her incarceration? Her aunt lived here. Quiet woman, never hurt anyone, took Sarah in out of pity. Sarah looked like a noble girl. Men prayed for her, but she wouldn't do anything. We had an outpatient clinic back then, and we didn't have a second nurse. Ray took pity and got this Sarah to work for us, and then they got together. But Sarah didn't last long, because they're not suited for family life. Mira was about a year and a half old when the guy showed up, all tattooed. He took Sarah away. We never saw her again. My aunt was very worried about her niece being so shameless. She probably died about two years ago. That's the story. Amanda, why don't you tell me how Ray's doing? I'm sitting here alone, like a cuckoo. People ask me questions, and I don't know what to say. Amanda calmed the woman down. He's already been moved to the general ward. If this keeps up, he'll be out in a couple weeks. The doctor hadn't told her when the treatment would end. She made up an idea on the fly to calm the elderly nurse. She still had to explain everything to her daughter when she came to visit. Katerina had a difficult character, and Amanda already knew that the conversation with her would not be easy. Her premonitions had not deceived her mother. On Friday night, her daughter burst into the house screaming, Mommy, your student has arrived for a visit. I'm starving. Feed me quickly. Mira ran out of the room. Katerina was stunned. Who's the miracle with the pigtails? While Amanda was thinking how she could carefully explain the appearance of a girl in their house, Mira herself came to Katerina and held out her hands. I'm Mira. And you are Katerina? The girl sat down. What a number. Mom, what's going on? Where did this ferret come from? Mira was confused. The girl did not understand why she caused indignation in the daughter of her benefactress. Amanda, for these two days which the girl spent in this house, told a lot about her daughter. But the little girl did not expect that she was so prickly. To protect herself, Mira said defiantly. If I am a ferret, then you are prickly. Amanda grinned and asked her daughter. Did you get it? Katerina laughed. Anyway, yes, well done, Button. She patted the little girl on the shoulder. I promise not to call names anymore. The girl smiled. Is it true that you're studying to be a doctor? Oh, you know that? No, I'm a long way from being a doctor. I will be a paramedic. Mira clapped her hands together happily. My dad's a paramedic. The smile fell off Katerina's face. I think I can guess who this lovely creature is. Amanda gave her daughter an expressive look, thus preventing further questioning. She sent Mira into the kitchen. Baby, put the kettle on, please. We're going to have dinner now. Katerina will wash her hands and we can sit down at the table. She followed her daughter into the bathroom and whispered fervently, Katerina, spare the child. There's no need to question her. She's been through enough. First her mother abandoned her, and now her father is in serious condition. Katerina froze. Daddy's sick? Yes. He fell through the ice. He was rescuing a drunk. He was in intensive care at first. But yesterday, he got better. The girl looked thoughtfully at the stream of water. You know, Mom, 
I don't have any feelings for this man. No pity, no hatred. It's empty. Amanda, please. And she looked at her daughter. Katerina, you can't do this. You're a medical student. You're supposed to be merciful. Was he merciful when he kicked us out of the house? Don't shout. Dad didn't kick us out. We left on our own. I don't know why you're defending him and why you brought that girl. He asked me to. Mom, I'm amazed at how naive you are. Have you forgiven him for everything? Katerina, please don't yell. I'll answer your question this way. You have to know how to forgive. You can't carry a stone on your soul all your life. And besides, I'm also guilty of many things. You just look at things differently now that you're older. The bathroom door opened and Mira's smiling face appeared. The kettle was already boiling. Enough talk. Go to dinner. Katerina grinned. Quickly she got used to it. Mom, and what do we belong to each other? Half-sisters. We have the same father, but our moms are different. That's funny. This conversation with her daughter had left an unpleasant residue on Amanda's heart. Of course, she knew that one day the moment would come when she would have to tell Catherine everything. But she hadn't expected that moment to arise at such an inopportune time. Already in complete silence, Mira looked back and forth at Amanda and Katerina. She sluggishly scraped her fork on her plate and refused tea and cookies. Amanda tried to lighten the mood and asked cheerfully, Girls, what shall we do after dinner? Katerina got up from the table. Personally, I'm going to bed. You guys have your own fun, Mom. I hope my bed isn't taken. No, it's not. You can go back to sleep. Worrying thoughts kept her awake. For the first time in her life, she didn't know what to do next. If she made one wrong move, it could be irreparable. She couldn't break her promise to Ray. But Katerina was also understandable, because she remembered the night when they had walked to the neighboring village in the pouring rain. Amanda did not notice how she fell into a restless sleep. She was being chased by some strangers. They were yelling at her, accusing her of something, but she couldn't hear them. The night terrors were cut short by the ringing of a cell phone. Amanda glanced at her watch. It was only six o'clock. Who needed her this early? A pleasant female voice answered the phone. Mrs. Amanda. Yes, it's me. It's the hospital in the neighborhood calling for you. Her heart froze for a moment, then began to pound at a frantic pace. She already realized the worst had happened, but she asked anyway. Did something happen to Mr. Ray? Yes, he died half an hour ago. I'm sorry to have to tell you this unpleasant news. How could it be? I mean, everything was fine yesterday. We were talking to him, and he was joking. The doctors tried to save him, but they couldn't. She did not let go of her cell phone, which was still ringing, but it sounded like a bell. They were deafening, making her heart clench. Her lips were still whispering. How could it be? After all, he felt quite well. There were no other thoughts in his head. They appeared later, when the woman realized the depth of the grief that had befallen her. Despite the years apart, Ray had remained close to her. Especially those few days that had been the last of his life had brought them closer together. Amanda remembered their last conversation in the hospital room and burst into tears. Ray, why did you have to die? I mean, we had such a good talk. I was hoping we could glue this broken cup back together. I was hoping I'd get a piece of simple womanly happiness. You're dead. The whole village saw the paramedic off for the last time. People from neighboring villages came to say goodbye to the deceased. Women were crying, and men kept a mournful silence. Only Victor cried without shying away from anyone. When the time came to say kind words about the deceased, the accordionist swore. He saved me, but he himself died. I swear in front of everyone that I won't take another drop in my mouth. Victor fell on his knees in front of the coffin. I swear I won't drink again. If I break my vow, then I won't live. Victor's speech touched everyone present. Even Grandfather David wept. Many kind words to Ray were said by colleagues who arrived from the district. Everyone expressed words of condolence to Amanda, and it didn't seem strange to anyone. Only Katerina asked sadly after the ceremony, Mom, why did everyone come to you? You've lived apart for so many years. The woman grinned bitterly. We were not officially divorced, so it turns out that I am now a widow. So Mira is my illegitimate daughter. Both women simultaneously looked at the girl, who was standing a little farther away from them. She was staring fixedly at the fresh mound covered with wreaths, but she was not crying. Katerina approached her and gently touched her shoulder. Sis, let's go home. 
The girl shook her head and jumped up cheerfully. No, I'll wait here, Katerina asked in surprise. What will you wait for, when Daddy wakes up? After all, he was not buried for good. It's all pretend. Katerina felt uncomfortable. She hugged the girl. Only in the movies, but in life it's real. Mira looked at Katerina so that she ran a shiver. Now I'm an orphan? Drop the bad thoughts. You have me and your mom. But Aunt Amanda is your mom, not mine. You can think of her as your mom. I do. I've never lied to a baby. So you're not going to put me in an orphanage? Waste paper or scrap metal? You're not recyclable, are you? The girl sighed heavily. I guess not. It's good that you won't give me away. They told me at school yesterday that they were going to send me to the orphanage. Amanda heard everything, but didn't interfere with her sister's conversation. She was surprised to think that Katerina had decided everything for her. The woman was not afraid of difficulties. She was afraid only, would she be able to give Mira everything that her father had given her? Only at the cemetery during the farewell, Amanda realized how much her father meant to this little girl. Mira didn't cry. She stood by the coffin and whispered something silently. Only later, when she heard the girls talking, did she realize that Ray's daughter didn't want to believe her father was dead. She must have been asking him to wake up. After her husband's funeral, Amanda took ten days to account for her vacation. Recent events had taken a toll on her, so she wanted to get her nerves in order and think about how to move on with her life. Mrs. Nika was glad that she would have to fill in for the club director. Mrs. Amanda, don't worry, everything will be fine. You just rest up, get your strength back. Nika spoke as if Amanda was going on a seaside vacation. But Amanda did not tell her deputy that the situation did not correspond to her cheerful mood. Amanda was unable to carry out her plans because on the second day of her unscheduled vacation, her parents came to visit. Mrs. Alla began with an apology. Daughter, I'm sorry we couldn't make it to the cemetery. My father's blood pressure spiked when he found out Ray died. I'm afraid of events like that. It's okay. It's okay. We got through it. People helped. It's nice to have someone to help. My dad and I have been thinking about it, and here's what we've decided. We're bored anyway, and you've got a big job to do. We'll let Ray's daughter stay with us. Amanda obviously didn't expect such a suggestion and was confused. Why would you go to all this trouble, and you both have health problems? Her father, who had been silent until then, said confidently, We have a problem from the fact that we sit alone and all day long look at each other. We scolded Leonid, and when he left, it became so dreary. Even in summer there's something to do, but in winter there's nothing to do but howl. My mother and I consulted and decided to help you. I'll gladly accept your help, but you don't have to relocate. And Mir's still getting used to it, so she's all over the girl at once. Let's not rush things. You'll get to know her first, and then we'll see. She is a very sociable girl, and I think we'll be very happy that she has grandparents. Will she be home from school soon? Amanda looked at her watch. She should be here any minute. Her father shouted contentedly. Then we'll wait. Why put off getting to know each other? They didn't have to wait long. Mira came home from school in high spirits. She washed her hands without hurrying, and only then made her way to the living room where Amanda's parents were waiting anxiously for her. At first the girl was confused. She did not expect to see guests, but as a well-mannered person should, she said hello. The husband and wife also greeted Mira. After the traditional ceremony, there was silence in the large room. It was up to Amanda to set the stage. Mir, this is my mom and dad, and you can call them. A mischievous glint appeared in the girl's eyes. I know. These are Katerina's grandparents. She told me so much about you. Father smiled. Only good things, I hope. Or did she call us old dear? The girl laughed. No, Katerina did not say such words. After only five minutes, Mira sat together with her grandparents and vividly explained to them why the big changes at school were necessary. The parents sat with their newfound granddaughter until late afternoon. As they were going home, Mrs. Alla confided to her daughter, I even forgot about my illnesses. The sweet little girl told us everything and promised to come and visit. It's not without reason that people say that common grief brings people together. Mom, I realized that yesterday. At the cemetery. Of course I'm sorry about what happened. 
Ray said so many nice things to me, hoping that we could get back to normal. Allah understood her daughter perfectly. Nothing, Amanda. There will be a holiday on your street. You're still a young, interesting woman. Before going to bed, Amanda went over the events of the last few days again, but she didn't feel the same longing as before. As she fell asleep, the woman thought that while she was on vacation, she should visit Ray's house. There was no way anyone would want to check what the dead man had left behind. The next day, Nika called and shouted into the phone, Mrs. Amanda, the inspectors are coming, so your presence is requested, Amanda promised. Okay, I'll be with them shortly. The club was often visited by different commissions, so Amanda was not afraid of such visitors, because she always had something to show and something to treat the guests. After the call, she also took out a box of chocolates and a pack of good tea. But the inspectors arrived just before lunch. Amanda took them to a separate office where folders with reporting documentation were already prepared. But the woman who headed the committee said with a smile, You must have been misinformed. We did not come to check you, but to learn from your experience. Everyone in the region praises your Museum of Folk Crafts, and we would like to create a similar one. In the early years of her work, Amanda began to collect various old utensils, dishes, irons, tablecloths, furniture. Many villagers brought her rare items themselves. At first, all these valuables were placed in one room, but people kept bringing all sorts of things, and it was necessary to think about expanding the space. That's when Amanda had the idea to create her own museum. The two rooms had to be combined, and the wall between them had to be torn down. The head of the municipality came to the opening of the museum and even gave a fiery speech. It's nice that we have real enthusiasts working in our village. Their example should inspire others. After all, they are the initiators of a very important cause, because they are trying to preserve for posterity the richness of our traditions. Mr. spoke a lot and with pathos, and the journalists who arrived with him recorded and filmed everything. Amanda also received a small fee for the opening of the museum, but that was the end of it. Once in a while, school children from the district center came for excursions, but no one was willing to adopt the experience. The guests kept asking questions, and Amanda thought she would have to change her plans again. It was only in the evening that she managed to get the guests out. So the trip had to be postponed. The next day she had to run to the club again because Nikki had urgent business to attend to. Then there was a flood at her parents' house, and she had to run around the village looking for the missing locksmith. Only on the very last day of the vacation, Amanda managed to escape to the neighboring village to check the house of her late husband. But when she reached her destination, she was surprised to find that someone had already been here. From the gate to the house stretched two chains of fresh footprints, and a shadow flashed through the window. A thought flashed through my mind. It's a burglar. We should call the police. But she didn't know where the local law enforcement officer lived. While I'm looking for him, the perpetrator might get away. That's okay. I'll take care of him myself. I'll yell if I have to. It was reassuring that the robber wouldn't attack her in broad daylight. Just in case, Amanda grabbed a heavy stick from the fence and walked toward the house. But as soon as she reached the porch, the door swung open, revealing a tall man in a good coat. His face was half in shadow, so the woman could not get a good look at the stranger. She was the first to ask, Who are you and what are you doing in someone else's house? The man did not budge. I want to ask you the same thing. At the most critical moment, the hat slipped completely down on the woman's face and she corrected it. The stranger exclaimed, Amanda! She took a few steps toward the porch and felt her tongue stick to her palate. Rick. He grinned. I can see by your surprised face that you weren't expecting to see me. You haven't changed much. Even your hair is the same as it was twenty years ago. A past resentment stirred in her heart, and she remarked not without sneer that you're still as cocky as ever. You haven't changed a bit. It's a trait every normal man has. Is it so hard to understand and remember? The man made a face that made Amanda want to slap him. Rick, let's not talk about normal. Tell me, why did you come back after 20 years? Did you really want to go back to your homeland? Nostalgia is one of the reasons. But there was another reason why I left home. I found out my brother died, so I came to check on the inheritance. But I'm going to disappoint you. Ray made a will, and it's not in your favor. Rick said with a chuckle. Of course the heir to all the wealth is you. 
The man spread his arms out as if he wanted to embrace the neighborhood. Amanda answered him in the same tone. Yes, I am. What do you have against it? Ray is my lawfully wedded husband and he has a daughter. Rick took a step closer to her. Amanda, calm down. I have no claim to this place even though my father built it. I'm here to visit my brother's grave. I believe today is the ninth day. Amanda felt her breath catch. No, it was yesterday. We mentioned Ray in private, but we didn't go to the cemetery. There's so much snow. You could drown. The man's come to his senses. Why are we standing on the doorstep? Come inside, where we can talk more comfortably. Amanda cautiously followed Rick, mentally marveling at his insolence, acting like a master. But out loud she asked, How did you get in the house? I have all the keys. Not all of them. I immediately realized that you changed the locks everywhere, and I remembered about our secret passage with Raydor to the basement. There's an old padlock. I always kept a spare key in the shed. I found it and used it. I didn't realize the basement was a way into the house. Thanks for the tip. I'll keep it in mind. The house was warm because Ray hadn't had time to turn off the steam heat before entering the hospital. It looked as if the owner had gone out for a while and would be right back. Rick, without taking off his shoes, walked through the house. Almost nothing had changed here. Everything was exactly the same as it had been before. Well, except for some little things, Amanda said sarcastically. You're not a good looker. Ray's running water, fixing the sewer system. The man grinned again. You make it sound like he did everything himself. That's exactly what he did. But you're the wife. Were you involved in all the changes, too? No, I didn't. Ray and I were separated by then. Rick whistled. Wow. I didn't know that. So it didn't work out? Well, I knew that from the beginning when you guys went behind my back. Amanda started choking again out of indignation. How dare you say that? You're the one who dumped me and got away with it. Not a reply, not a word. If it wasn't for Ray. Unexpectedly, Amanda cried. The tears that had accumulated over twenty years flowed out of her eyes uncontrollably. Rick hadn't expected such a reaction, and was shifting from foot to foot in confusion. Amanda was saying something to him, but her speech was incoherent, and the man didn't understand a word. He tried to reassure her, but she screamed, You better not come near me, and get out of here. I don't like being in the same room with you and breathing the same air. The man realized that the former lover said all this in a fever, and she needed time to calm down. He decided not to unnerve her and retired to the next room. Little by little Amanda was coming to her senses. She was very ashamed of herself for snapping. Rick came out of his hiding place. What's up? Are you calmed down? Yeah, I'm sorry I was so hysterical. I was good too. It's because we weren't prepared for this meeting, even though I knew I'd see you. It's a complete surprise to me that you showed up. Again, I'm sorry. Something just came over me. After such a stormy encounter there was a period of confusion. They both felt awkward, but didn't dare to ask about the most important thing. Finally Rick asked to see where his brother was buried. Amanda breathed a sigh of relief. He was buried next to his parents. He'd asked for it. It was as if he sensed that he would soon leave this world. Amanda told her husband's brother about her last conversation with him. Let's not waste any time. Let's go to the cemetery. All right. Uh-huh. I just have to stop by the outpatient clinic first. I left my car there. I was afraid I'd get stuck off-road. There's such a nice woman who works there. I asked her to look after my car. Amanda smiled. That's Sophia, the nurse, and they know Ray. After all, I left home when I was 15, went to college, then the army. Then I met you, the woman asked. Rick, let's not dredge up the past. It's not worth it. You're probably right. After you two got married, I decided never to come back here again. I made a vow. Rick, I asked you to. All right, I won't say anything. They went to the cemetery together, and they were quiet by Ray's grave. On their way back to the village, Amanda suddenly asked, You said you came to visit after our wedding? But Ray didn't say anything to me. I was very angry and resentful of you. I didn't want to see you. So I sprung Ray on you and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him. He called me a scumbag and told me not to show up again. That's basically what happened. Amanda didn't want to dig into the past anymore, so she started asking Rick about his current life. 
He was happy to tell her about his business and that he travels to interesting places every year. Amanda. You won't believe this, but I've seen the whole world already. I saw the first part when I went to sea. And now I spend money on my favorite hobby with pleasure. Amanda grinned. And how does your wife look at that kind of spending? He took his eyes away from the woman. So lively, so ruthless. Always trying to hit the sorest spot. I'm not married, Amanda. Tried it once and it didn't work. I have no desire to push my luck any further. Time flew by quickly as they talked. Amanda looked at her watch and gasped. I've got to go. Mira's coming home from school and I'm not home. Daughter. Yeah, Ray's daughter. He tried to start a family again, but he had no luck, raising his daughter on his own. Just before he died, he asked me to take care of her. The woman's voice trembled and Rick gently touched her arm. I'm sorry I hurt you again. But I didn't know Ray had a daughter. I thought you two had a child together. I have a daughter too, but she's an adult in medical school. She's 19. Amanda stared straight into his eyes, trying to see confusion or curiosity. But there was only longing in them. Rick didn't even notice how she specifically pointed out that she had a daughter. Amanda mentally scolded herself for the provocative answer and hurriedly bid the man farewell. She felt it was futile to continue communicating with Rick. Only later, already in the evening, she was overcome by such a longing that she cried into her pillow all night again. Why am I like this? Who needs my pride? Why didn't I tell him about my daughter? She had no answers to any of these questions. There was no hope that anything could change in her life. And that made her feel even sadder. The unexpected encounter with Amanda had turned Rick's mind upside down. When he'd headed here, he hadn't ruled out the possibility of a chance meeting with his first love, now his younger brother's widow. But what he hadn't expected was for the wires to suddenly short-circuit inside of him. After all, it had been so many years. He'd been with a lot of women since Amanda, and Rick always chose the bright and glamorous ladies. But none of them gave him the happiness that most men dream of. He has long chosen a life partner and married at 34 years old. But in the first months of life together, modest girl with a beautiful name, Dorothy turned into a pompous hydra, capable of only consuming, giving nothing in return. Dorothy loved parties, meetings with friends and expensive restaurants. Although Rick's business gave a steady income and they were not poor, he immediately realized that his young wife would ruin him. About two years later, the man tried to gently set her straight. Dorothy, a young woman, and even married, does not have to go to restaurants every day. You could cook something delicious at home with your own hands, and we could have a memorable romantic evening for two. His wife gave him a condescending look. Rick, did you really just say that? Romantic evenings are for you-know-who? He smiled. For lovers, of course. Wrong answer. Evenings like that are for poverty-stricken startup guys. They're the only ones who can watch the candle burn endlessly and get stunned by cheap champagne. Rick was dumbfounded by that answer. And his wife continued to push her line. Rick, I didn't marry you to run around the apartment in a bathrobe and cook. Most women think that's normal. There's a reason they say a woman is the keeper of the home. Dorothy was angry. Rick, please don't talk about a woman's purpose in front of me again. I want to live for myself first and then kids and housekeeping and everything else. Thank you. I've seen it all since I was a kid. That's why I decided to live a beautiful life first, and then I'll protect the home, Rick exclaimed. But I don't like this scheme, and I don't want you to go to the pubs with your friends and then sleep until noon. Then you'll have to find another wife. Rick didn't take his young wife's advice, but three years after the wedding, he sent her back to her parents. Surprisingly, his parents, about whom Dorothy had said unbeknownst to him, didn't even resent him. They only expressed regret that it had happened that way. They liked Rick, and they were glad that they had successfully settled their daughter. But their joy was short-lived. By the way, later it turned out that Dorothy's mother worked all her life as an elementary school teacher and has never been a slave, and her father ran a construction company. After a failed marriage, Rick decided never to tie himself to the family ties again. He was quite satisfied with a free relationship without any obligations. Only sometimes, especially in the evenings, something began to twinge under his heart, and an unpleasant inner voice gave disappointing predictions for the future. Sow and grow old alone. 
No children, no kitten. True, lately this invisible critic crawls out of its hiding place less and less often, and one not-so-good day Rick realized that if his doppelganger is silent, it means that he, the real Rick, is getting old. He also realized that he couldn't change his life dramatically, and it was too late for that. But after his meeting with Amanda on the third day or so, that invisible someone came back to life. Rick, you acted like an idiot in front of her. Why would I do that? You saw that's not what she expected from you. You could have made a move to rekindle the relationship. It wouldn't have cost you anything. And you? You couldn't even talk to a woman like a human being. Of course, he tried to argue with his other self, but every match ended in his favor. One day, after a fight, Rick lost his temper. What am I supposed to do? I'm 45 years old, thank God. Another five years and I'll be celebrating my half-century anniversary. It's time to think about mortality, not about love. An inner voice asked me. Have you heard such an expression without statute of limitations? It is applicable not only in law, but also in relationships. If love is real, it also has no statute of limitations. In short, the internal battle with himself had worn Rick down so much that he decided to make another trip to his childhood village. Amanda agonized for a week and then decided that she would once again visit the house she had inherited. Perhaps deep down, she hoped to meet Rick there again. But even without the lyrical digression, any property, including those in the village, needed constant maintenance. That was why she had decided to go there with the girls to clean up and just relax. Contrary to the expectation that Katerina would wrinkle her nose, both girls happily accepted her plan. Mira ran around the house screaming, Yay! I'll be able to pick up my toys and go visit Grandma Sophia. Katerina had more modest plans. Rolling her eyes, she said, Oh, I'd better get some sleep, because I'm walking like a somnambulist, stumbling along. I can't wait for this study to be over. I can't imagine how some of the smart ones plan to go straight to university. Amanda, you're getting worried? I remember that you also wanted to continue your studies. Katya stretched sweetly. Life can change in a day. I don't know what I had planned before. Now I'd rather get my diploma and find a dusty place. What do you mean a safe place? Katerina, what are you up to? It's nothing special. I just don't want to die in the country like my father. A good friend promised me a place in a private clinic. And what will you be? A receptionist at best? Did you have to study so many years for that? Katerina hugged her mother. Do not aggravate. Each person is looking for the best. And besides, I don't want to be your competition. In our family there is enough and one heroine. After the conversation with her daughter, her mood was a little soured. But Amanda wasn't going to postpone the trip because of it. The three of them quickly packed everything they needed and left. It was quiet, and at first it seemed as if no one lived in the village. But the wispy haze over the rooftops suggested otherwise. Amanda assessed the traffic situation. The girl's gonna have to walk. See how it's all snowed in? Katerina reluctantly left the car. Oh, I just relaxed. Walking again? Amanda cheered her up. Nothing. The fresh air will cheer you up. And then you and your sister will clean up afterwards. Katerina replied. Mercy. It's cruel of you to force a poor student to work. Mira tried to keep up with her older sister. Every statement of Katerina she supported with a cheerful laugh. When they reached the house, Amanda stopped the girls. Take your time, we need to look around. She walked along the fence, but this time there was no sign of an intruder. The woman exhaled with relief. Everything seems to be okay, girls. We can go in. Mira was the first to skip into the house where nothing had changed. The girl immediately ran to her room. I missed you. Amanda looked at her sadly thinking the poor girl was homesick. She hugged the girl. Mira, do you feel like coming back here? The girl nodded her head. I'd like that very much, but I can't live here alone. It is not proper for children to live without adults. They quickly cleaned up the house, and then it became clear that everyone was hungry. Mira rushed to the refrigerator. We'll cook something now, but all the food stored in there had fallen into disrepair. The same picture was observed in the lockers. The situation was critical, Katerina said disappointedly. It seems that today we have an unloading day. We'll have to go home. Amanda sighed. She would have to. I'd rather not, though. 
To be honest, I'm a little apprehensive about driving in the evening, Mir suggested cheerfully. We should call Grandma Sophia and ask her for food. Or I could run over. She doesn't live far from here. Half an hour later, they were already sitting at the table, and Sophia was persistently serving them. And I knew there would be guests. I made cabbage pies this morning. Ray loved my baked goods, and I always gave him a treat. And now there's no one else to do it for. There was an oppressive silence in the room, but the hostess said cheerfully, It's all right. They promised to send me a young paramedic soon. I've already met him. His name is Nicola. He's a good-looking fellow, a city boy himself, but he wants to work in the village. Amanda cast a fleeting glance at her daughter. My Katerina, on the contrary, wants to stay in the city. The old woman took a closer look. Is that Katerina? She is. She's all grown up now. And I remember her like this. Sophia showed the approximate height of the Katerina she remembered. And you probably don't remember running to the outpatient clinic with your father? No, I don't remember that. Amanda could see that her daughter didn't like the older woman's questions. Let's go home. So, you've had your time. Oh no, I'm having fun. You can die of boredom here in winter. There are almost only old people left. We've recently been told that the store will be closed. We'll have to run to your village for groceries. Sophia complained about the boring life for another five minutes, and the guests had to listen to these complaints out of respect. They were about to go to bed when suspicious noises were heard in the yard. Amanda gingerly pulled back the curtain. Oh my God, who the hell was that in the middle of the night? Girls, who was the last person to come in? Katerina nodded at her sister. Mira, did you close the door? Katerina, go check. What strangers are heading our way? The girl rushed to the door, but uninvited guests ahead of her. Hello to you in the house. You weren't expecting us, but we came. Two people rushed into the house. The woman was short and sloppily dressed. The man, on the contrary, looked quite respectable. Only his unusual manner of speaking cut the ear. Without asking permission, he threw off his coat and rubbed his hands together. What are we doing? Let's set the table since we have guests came. Everything that was happening did not give the hostess a chance to regain her senses. Katerina, too, was in a state of shock. Only little Mira said sternly, Guests are guests when they are called. And we didn't invite anyone. This is someone else's house. Go away. The man wanted to pat the girl on the cheek. No, chicken. This isn't someone else's house. If you talk to Uncle Gil like that, he's going to get mad at you. Well, what are we doing? Sarah and I stopped from afar. The man turned to his companion. Sarah, which one is your daughter? The woman giggled, then pointed uncertainly at Mira. That one, I think. Before Amanda knew it, the guest had picked Mira up in his arms and was spinning her around the house. Rejoice, child of nature. Your mommy is back, and I'll be your daddy now. Katerina's voice sounded very loud. Come on, dear guests. Get out of here. The girl opened the front door, but the imposters were in no hurry to leave the house. Suddenly, Sarah spoke up. I don't understand. What's going on and why are you calling the shots here? This is my common-law husband's house. He's a paramedic. Amanda could tell from the woman's speech that she'd had a little too much to drink. Katerina whispered to her mother. We should call the police. Katerina. What police? Have you forgotten where you are? Willie Amanda and her eldest daughter tried to escort the guests out. Mira ran outside. She started screaming in the street. Help. We're being robbed. It's well known that unexpected action is sometimes much more effective than a well-developed plan. Hearing the girls' screams, the criminal duo hurried out of the house, but the alarm signal given by Mira was heard by concerned neighbors, who rushed to the house of the paramedic. At the peak moment, a huge car pulled up to the gathering place, eliciting an exclamation of delight from Mira. Wow, what a cool car. Rick stepped out of the car. He looked at everyone in surprise. Are you guys having a party? Katerina looked at the newcomer with disbelief. Sort of. Some guests have left, now others have arrived. Uncle, do you want to stay in this house too? Rick looked at the girl, then at Amanda, who was staring at him. The man didn't have time to answer the provocative question. Amanda beat him to it. Katerina, this is Ray's own brother and your father. This confession was said quite loudly and made everyone present stunned. But Rick was the most confused. Amanda. 
Is this a joke? The woman grinned. Is this kind of thing a joke? Katerina is your own daughter. If you don't believe me, you can take a test. Don't think we're making a claim. I just can't keep it all inside of me anymore. This news stunned Katerina as much as Rick. The girl looked at the strange man, and it seemed to her that everything was happening in a dream. Only one felt quite comfortable. She was glad that the ugly aunt who called her mom was gone. The girl thought, I'd rather ask Aunt Amanda to adopt me or I'll live with my grandparents. When the passion settled down a bit, everyone walked into the house. The girls realized that the adults needed to talk, and they quietly hid in the room where Mira's nursery used to be. Amanda was afraid to look into Rick's eyes. She was already repenting for revealing her biggest secret in front of everyone. I guess you weren't prepared for this turn, he wheezed uneasily. To be honest, I was. But why am I only finding out now that I have a daughter? Why didn't you tell me before? When, Rick? You went to sea and I never heard from you. It took me a month to realize we were having a baby. I kept hoping you'd come back. I waited for you but you never showed up. So I told Ray everything. And he asked me to marry him. I didn't have time to think about it. I didn't want my child to be fingered as illegitimate. The man wrapped his arms around his head. Oh my God. Who would have thought this would happen? I couldn't get in touch with you and my parents. Our ship was arrested in a Polish port and we were held there for two months. We weren't even allowed to go down the gangway. If it hadn't been for the help of our embassy, we would have starved to death. And then I come home and find out my fiancé's already married. I almost killed Ray, Amanda cried quietly. Oh my God, just one accident but so many broken lives. And the worst part is there's no going back. You shouldn't say that. Do you really believe that we met by chance? No, it was fate. She tried to correct all our mistakes. Now the main thing is not to lose what we've regained. They sat by the window for a long time, sharing their innermost thoughts with each other. And now that they were twenty years apart, they both wanted to warm each other's hearts. He gently stroked her hand. Amanda, I want to tell you. She put her finger to his lips. Don't say anything. Don't say anything now. Let our hearts be at least a little calmer. The girls looked out of the room out of curiosity and hid themselves again. Katerina said, Let's not disturb them. I have a feeling that we'll make a friendly family.